Fourier transform is a mathematical tool that is used in a wide range of applications from quantum mechanics to telecommunications and image processing. It is named after the French mathematician Joseph Fourier, whose name is inscribed on the Paris side of the Eiffel Tower. To know more about Joseph Fourier, I am now joined by the 2010 Fields Medal winner, Cedric Villani. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Who was Joseph Fourier and why are his mathematical concepts that are more than 200 years old still so relevant? Joseph Fourier was a French mathematician from the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, so during the time of the French Revolution, a period in which there were so many bright mathematicians in France and a period in which maybe political and scientific have been as close as is possible. There never was a time in our history in which political affairs and scientific affairs were so close as during that time. And Joseph Fourier rose to prominence because of his ability, of his skills in analysis and in particular his theory of heat which um, was opening up a whole new branch of physics and a whole new branch of mathematics. So Fourier remained for the generations after him as the emblematic hero of mathematical physics. Some people even say he's the creator of mathematical physics with uh, the, the view that to, to start a new branch of physics, sometimes you have to develop the relevant mathematical tools coming there. And uh, before I turn to explain about his theory, let me say that Fourier is also famous for having a great career in politics, which is not common. Laplace, his contemporary, had a great career in math, but a disaster, a disastrous career in politics. But Fourier was very good in politics. He was a, a préfet, so the local authority representing the government, but he was a préfet during under Napoleon and under the restoration of monarchy and then again uh, under Napoleon again when Napoleon briefly came back to try and reclaim power he was well known for his efficiency and his diplomatic skills he, and on the ground he was well known for his ability to really conduct and lead some operations like dry the swamps like uh, make sure that the roads are being built, etc. Super efficient. Now about the, about the theory of Fourier. Like many mathematicians, I have taught Fourier analysis to my students at university. I have a course in Fourier analysis and so on. And in this course there are several things. First, we explain how the heat, which seems so difficult, you know, to, to seize, uh, came under the realm of mathematics. Fourier won this competition by the Academy of Sciences about the nature of heat. And uh, his, uh, the, the, the sentence he had chosen for the manuscript, et ignem regunt numeri. This is ancient Latin language. And it says, even fire is, uh, obeys the laws of numbers. That is enormous. You know, before that there was theory of Newton, but Newton is about the positions, you know, something is attracted, you can understand. Where, where is the position that is the unknown? Or Euler, a fluid, we understand what is the velocity of a fluid, we can, we can, we can see it goes fast and, or, or slow. But the heat, how to put numbers on this? You need to construct uh, references, how it is uh, transmitted is mysterious. There was, for hundreds of years, people had views about the nature of heat, about the nature of fire, etc. And Fourier tells you, whatever it is, we can put it under an equation. And that equation is a main example of partial differential equation. One of the most famous is called the heat equation. In its simplest version, it's one of the most simple partial differential equations that you learn in a course of mathematical physics. And the first great contribution of Fourier then is this. There is an equation, 
a partial differential equation, so it involves the tendencies, the partial different de derivatives, with respect to space or with respect to time of the process you want to study, which is the heat in a solid body. And the second contribution is uh, this equation, we cannot just write it, we can also solve it in certain situations with particular cases, particular geometry, etc., etc. And third contribution is to do this, we shall be interested in the frequencies of functions. Like imagine you are, it's, um, you are looking at the heat in a metal bar, you know, just a line. And uh, Fourier discovered it's much simpler to think of this as something periodic. You have your bar and uh, you think of a, a signal, not just this, you know, maybe the heat is in the middle, it's like this, but like this, and then this, you symmetrize, and then etc., etc. And see this as if it was a phenomenon on an infinite line, but periodic, and be interested in the frequencies. And so he discovers that you can solve the equation if you have a cosine or a sine function whose period is a multiple uh, of, uh, of this uh, length. And he starts developing his whole theory, now it's called the Fourier theory, in which you have a duality between the positions, distances, and frequencies. Frequencies are inverses of distances. And the Fourier transform is something which to a function on the space, a function of distances, associates a function on frequencies. And you can go back and forth. There's a theory for periodic signals, and the theory for non-periodic signals, which is called Fourier transform, the first Fourier series, the other Fourier transform. And that is a fundamental way of looking at things. So a Fourier theory is not just for heat, then it's for uh, the analysis of sound, which is of course about frequencies, but also the analysis of any function. It was discovered that you can read the regularity of a function on its Fourier uh, transform. If the Fourier transform decays fast, it means that the function is regular. So for uh, everybody who's interested in functions, the variations of signals, Fourier analysis is part of the basic tools. And there are people who are specialists of Fourier analysis, harmonic analysis, as we say. And uh, the, you have books thick like this about all the developments of this Fourier analysis, which is a beautiful, amazing theory. Now, uh, this can be applied to an extraordinary number of problems. One of the problems that Fourier himself applied it to was to try and contribute to the problem of the age of the Earth. And he was imagining, okay, there, there had been so many speculations about the age of the Earth, should we uh, find the age in the Bible or should we do experiments, etc. And the model is this. Imagine the Earth is like a, a solid ball of iron. Initially at creation, it is, um, you know, at the point of fusion of, uh, of, of the iron. And then, but the, at the exterior, it is cold. So you have a, it's like if you have a cake, take the cake out of the oven, and the cake will get cooler, but not uniformly. The interior remains warmer than the outside. So you have a profile heat, a heat profile. And the distribution of that heat profile tells you about the age. If you wait very long enough, it will become completely cold. And Fourier shows how you can relate, in this model, the age of the Earth, to the only thing that you can measure from the surface of the Earth, which is the gradient of increase of temperature when you go deep in the ground. And he obtains a beautiful formula, beginning of the, um, uh, it must be 80, 8, 1810 or something like this. Beautiful formula about the age of the Earth. Uh, the formula is very beautiful. Fourier, however, does not give a number. And he's right not to give a number because, as we know now, actually the model is completely false because the Earth is not like a solid ball. Inside the mantle is like fluid and so on. But anyway, this work by Fourier influenced very much Lord Kelvin, who uh, in the... Um, late 19th century, beginning 80, uh, 20th century, so 100 years after Fourier, was very much infatuated with the Fourier theory, very much infatuated with the problem of the age of the Earth. And um, uh, it's a problem that I, 
I read at length what Kelvin wrote about it because it's a very famous episode of controversy in the history of sciences when Kelvin and Darwin had very heated arguments. And Kelvin talks of Fourier's contribution as a great mathematical poem, the great poem of Fourier. And this is to say that what Fourier has discovered is not just an equation or not just a solution or not just a solution of one problem. It's a whole world together with its tools, its point of view, a way of seeing things. It's a whole world, so it's really a poetic creation. You know, poetry is like creation. Poem is something that creates a world. And Fourier, in this sense, is a poet. And Fourier, interestingly, also is credited with uh, discovering the greenhouse effect. Can you tell us more about it? Uh, I, I personally think it a bit exaggerated to attribute to Fourier the greenhouse effect, but for sure, the, um, the, the quantitative physics relating the um, gases, the mechanics and the heat goes back to Fourier. Fourier theory that I was mentioning, so Fourier's main contribution is about the heat in solids. But Fourier was very much aware that the heat works differently, and he writes about it in the solids and in the fluids. And the fluids are a bit different in the liquids or in the gas. But uh, he's very much aware of this, and Fourier is the first uh, mathematical laws behind the evolution of the heat. So he paves the way to the thermodynamics, which becomes developed from the middle of the 19th century, so about one generation after Fourier. And he paved the way for the discovery of the greenhouse effect, according to which certain con con concentrations of certain gas will induce an increase of the heat when you heat by the sun, for instance, your mixture.